Doug, PhD at Stanford. Um, he has a number of, of high profile awards. He's a scientist, a planetary scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory just up the, up the road. Uh, he was formerly the deputy chief scientist for solar system uh, exploration for a number of years and was the project scientist on a potential Europa lander mission to land on the, the, the Jovian moon Europa, this icy, icy world, and look for the evidence of life. Um, he was selected by James Cameron to take samples from hydrothermal vents under, uh, under the sea, both in the Atlantic and the Pacific, um, and was featured in the film, the IMAX film, Aliens of the Deep, and he is the PI of the JPL Ocean Worlds Lab. So I, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker for tonight, Dr. Kevin Hand. All right, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here, Cam and the whole Astronomy on Tap uh, crew. Is this, I don't know if this is sustainable. Um, <laughs> how am I gonna, the, uh, the, the mechanics of advancing the slides are a little compromised, I don't think. No, no, this is fine, this is fine. Uh, uh, excellent, well thank you so much all for coming. Uh, great turnout and uh, really appreciate the invitation. Um, as Cam mentioned, I, uh, I do have a book. I brought some copies, and happy to sell these for 20 bucks after the, uh, after the talk. Um, the question of whether or not life exists beyond Earth is one of humanity's oldest and most profound and unanswered of questions. And it encompasses a tremendous landscape of possibilities. And I think it's really important to just set your expectations tonight at the right level. Tonight, I will not be talking about UFOs, alien abductions, ET, or plush creatures that you can find at your local Target. I know it's so sad. But when we talk about the search for life beyond Earth, when NASA typically talks about the search for life beyond Earth, we are talking about the search for even the tiniest of micro. Because the discovery of even a single celled organism would truly transform our understanding of the universe and the role of biology in that universe. And over the course of our past 60 plus years of exploring our solar system, we have made a, an incredible discovery. And shown here is a diagram put together by National Geographic, where each of these lines indicates a spacecraft launched by NASA or the European Space Agency or the Russian Space Agency. The bright lines were successful missions, the more muted colors uh, failed in some way or other. So many lines out to the moon and out to Mars and some to Venus. But just a few spacecraft, just a few lines extend beyond the asteroid belt. These lines represent spacecraft with names like Pioneer and Voyager, Galileo and Cassini, and more recently Juno and New Horizons. And by merit of these few spacecraft, we have very good reason to predict that oceans, oceans of liquid water, exist beyond Earth. And shown here is what I like to call a portrait of the ocean worlds of our solar system. At the center, of course, is the Earth with the ocean that we know and love and need to protect. And around the Earth, I've got Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, three moons of Jupiter, Titan, and Enceladus, two moons of Saturn, and I've even included Neptune's curious moon, Triton. These six moons, and possibly many others, are covered in ice, and in the case of Titan, it also has a, a thick atmosphere. And beneath their icy shells, we have good reason to predict that there exist global, potentially salty, liquid water oceans. And these worlds, with their oceans, are really transforming our understanding of what it takes for a world to be habitable. 
in the early days of planetary science and astronomy, we had this kind of Goldilocks framework for what it takes for a world to be habitable. It was, uh, you know, Venus too close to the sun, too hot, Mars too far away from the sun, too cold. Earth at one astronomical unit had just the right amount of energy from our parent star, from the sun, so as to maintain and sustain a liquid water ocean on its surface. Now the story of Venus, Earth, and Mars and their evolution over the history of our solar system is much more complicated than just a simple Goldilocks thing. But these ice-covered moons of the outer solar system are teaching us that in the planetary context, this is an old Goldilocks. The idea that habitability is largely determined by energy received from the parent star, that is kind of out of date. These moons that orbit giant planets present a new Goldilocks, one wherein the energy for maintaining and sustaining liquid water comes not from the photons of the sun, but rather from the tidal energy uh, dissipation that occurs as these moons orbit giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn and, and so forth. And there's no better example of the, of the sheer magnitude of that energy than Jupiter's innermost large moon, Io, shown here in the instant. This plume to the north of Io, uh, near the north pole of Io, is a volcanic eruption. Io is the most volcanically active body in our solar system. And it is so volcanically active because of that tidal tugging pull it feels as it orbits Jupiter. And so in this new Goldilocks, we've got a framework where Io is kind of like Venus. Io has so much tidal energy, so much energy, it lost any water that it may have once had. Callisto might be a little bit like Mars. It's too far out. We don't think there's much tidal dissipation going on in Callisto. If it has an ocean, it might be sustained through radiogenic decay. But in the middle, we've got Europa and Ganymede. And Europa in particular, which I'll focus on tonight, really, we think, does occupy this new sweet spot in the Goldilocks scenario where it's got just enough tidal energy to maintain a global liquid water ocean of perhaps 100 kilometers in depth. And above that, it's got an ice shell of a few to perhaps 20 to 30 kilometers in thickness. And that's nice because that means that the ice shell may serve as a window into the ocean below. And so when it comes to the search for life beyond Earth, these alien oceans, these ice-covered ocean worlds beyond Earth, are incredibly compelling because they contain so much liquid water today. And if we've learned anything from life on Earth, it's that where you find the liquid water, you almost always find life. Whether it's life in extreme environments, like the hydrothermal vents, or hot springs in the Rift Valley of Africa, or the dry valleys of Antarctica, whether it's life in extreme environments or life of extreme lifestyles, <laughs> all life on Earth depends on liquid water. And I'd like to show this montage for another reason, and that is that for all of the incredible diversity of life on Earth, from the most extreme of hydrothermal vent microbe to the most extreme of uh, rock star, we're all connected by the same tree of life. We all function on DNA, RNA, proteins, and ATP. We are all connected by this tree of life, which of course, to give the microbes their due, this tree of life is dominated by microbes. We, uh, you know, just for reference, uh, Mick and Keith are down here along with us in a tiny little offshoot in the eukaryotic branch. And so considerations of the tree of life are incredibly important in the context of our search for life elsewhere. And these ice-covered ocean worlds offer the possibility of searching for and potentially finding new independent trees of life. If we go to Europa, if we go to Titan or Enceladus or any of these moons, there is a chance that a second independent origin of life occurred. It may or it may not have converged on DNA and RNA and proteins, etc. It may have figured out a completely different way of getting the business of life done. We just don't know. 
that's an important contrast with our search for life on Mars. I love Mars. We got any Martians out there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love Mars. I work on the Perseverance rover. Here is a picture of two uh, uh, holes in a rock that we sampled and collected the cores. Uh, it, we're collecting these cores to come back to Earth. Incredibly valuable in the context of understanding the formation of Mars, the evolution of our solar system, and the past habitability and potential for inhabitants on ancient Mars. But our search for life on Mars is focused on the search for trace organics that might indicate life three and a half billion years ago. We're not gonna find DNA and RNA and proteins in rocks like this. Those large molecules don't last that long in the rock record. They last maybe 10 to 100 million years. And so when we think about trying to distinguish a separate tree of life and understand the biochemistry of an alien ecosystem, really it's worlds like Europa and the other ocean worlds where liquid water exists today, where these oceans exist today, where extant life could be alive today that offer incredibly compelling uh, targets in our search for finding not just evidence of life beyond Earth, but also investigating that life and understanding its origin and relationship to life here on Earth. So here's Europa. I love all of the ocean worlds, but um, I'd be lying if I didn't say Europa wasn't my favorite. Uh, Europa is about the size of our moon, shown to scale relative to the Earth, all shown to scale relative to Jupiter, which is some 318 times as massive as the Earth. And by some estimates, if you could stand on Europa, the tidal rise and fall would lift you up by about 100 feet with, uh, with each uh, daily cycle on Europa, which is equivalent to about a little more than three and a half Earth years. Tonight, I do not have time to go into uh, how we think we know the ocean exists. Uh, I typically like to break it into three easy pieces. And I'll just say that um, to go into that, please read the book. <laughs> Shameless book. But with the, those lines of evidence, we now uh, think that Europa is structured like this. It's got an iron core, a rocky silicate mantle, this global ocean of perhaps 60 miles or 100 kilometers in depth and then this ice shell overlying that ocean. A, uh, a little science story that I want to share with you tonight uh, describes how we think we know something about the chemistry of the ocean by looking at the surface. And in this diagram, I just want to draw your attention to the charged particles in the upper left here, because that's an important component of this story. Here's what Europa looks like up close. Uh, these, the tides, we think, cause these fractures, these cracks in the ice. Thank you. <laughs> and then this different colored material, this sort of yellowish, reddish, brownish material, populates various parts of Europa's surface. And you can see that it's along some of these ridges, which will kind of implicate that that material might be erupting or coming up from the ocean below. And in the early days after the, uh, the Galileo mission started returning spectra of Europa's surface, a tremendous debate ensued about what is the composition of that dark material on Europa. And shown here in uh, the bold line is a spectrum of Europa collected by the near infrared mapping spectrometer on Galileo. And beneath that are various candidate mixtures that various people proposed as an explanation for the NIMS spectra of Europa. And broadly, these uh, hypotheses broke into two camps, the exogenic camp and the endogenous camp, endogenous camp. The exogenous camp basically said, well, the spectra of Europa are best explained by sulfuric acid hydrate. You might say, what the heck is sulfuric acid hydrate doing on the surface of Europa? Well, Io, is erupting sulfur. Some of that sulfur gets implanted on Europa and it gets turned into sul uh, sulfuric acid. And it's this way. Come on. Meanwhile, others said, uh, I think we might be seeing some frozen salts. And that's very significant because that implies an endogenous <coughs> origin. It implies salts coming up from the ocean below. 
it implies that the ice shell is revealing some of the ocean chemistry. But debate as these two different camps might uh, have done uh, decades ago, you can see that the, the NIMS spectra were quite poor in resolution, and so that debate persisted. And then about a decade or so ago, uh, working in my lab at JPL, the Ocean Worlds Lab, which uh, I've got an incredible team of students who've come through. And if you're a student out there in the audience looking for work, I always need warm bodies in the lab. So uh, delighted to put you to work on some of these experiments. But in this particular case, um, in one of the chambers that we built up a number of years ago, a chamber that I like to call our Europa in a can, shown here, we can pump down, cool down, we can get to Europa temperatures and pressures, and then we can also turn on an electron gun to bombard ices and salts and other things with the irradiation that is experienced on the surface of Europa. And so I've got a mini Europa up at JPL. Here's what it looks like looking in the chamber, and that little centimeter square target is where we can replicate Europa to a very high degree in the lab. And so for tonight's story, the important experiment involved sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, as you all know and love, it's flat white to the eye. Spectroscopically, it's also flat. It's featureless. And that's part of why spectroscopists hadn't really searched for it uh, with the Galileo spacecraft and with other uh, uh, ground and space-based space telescopes. But I decided to put in sodium chloride and see what happens to sodium chloride under Europa conditions. And this is a video showing the irradiation of a sodium chloride evaporite under Europa conditions. And when I pulled this sample out, my jaw dropped because the sodium chloride had changed color from that flat white to this yellowish brownish and in some cases more of a reddish color. And along with these images, I also collected spectra showing very specific absorption features associated with what are called F and M centers in the crystal lattice of alkali halides. Basically, electrons get trapped in the anion vacancies. Uh, for those of you that want to nerd out, it was actually really important in the early days of studying the harmonic oscillator and, and how uh, uh, to um, understand uh, the, um, the wave equation. In any case, back to Europa. Uh, after doing these experiments, uh, my friend and colleague Mike Brown down at, uh, at Caltech, uh, we teamed up to see if we could collect some spectra from Hubble. And Samantha Trumbo, who was a, uh, a bright young grad student at the time, led this effort. And this is just a beautiful example of science actually working. All too often with our experiments and our theories and our connection of theories to experiments, they never actually match up quite the way we hope they will or would. In this case, it actually worked beautifully. So shown at left are those lab experiments. In red here is part of the spectrum from my lab of the irradiated sodium chloride. That dip only appears after irradiation. It's almost like an invisible ink situation where the irradiation on the surface of Europa uh, reveals spectroscopically that sodium chloride is there. And so Sam then, uh, uh, with the Hubble data, was able to map it out to this yellowish region on Europa where that dip beautifully is matched with the Hubble data shown in black here. So from, from uh, idea to experiment to prediction to data collection with Hubble, and then lo and behold, we found sodium chloride and oceanic salt on the surface of Europa. And I do think this is the best indication of water rock chemistry in the ocean below the ice shell of Europa. Now there's a whole suite of magnetometry experiments that I describe in my book, which you can buy after the talk for $20. <laughs> okay, uh, looking to the future. And, uh, and so Europa Clipper is gonna get launched this October. It will enter uh, Jupiter orbit in, early, in the early 2030s, it'll make about 45 flybys of Europa. Knock on wood, it'll hopefully make a lot more uh, because it'll hopefully have an extended mission. And then at about the same time, the European Space Agency JUICE mission will also be in orbit around Jupiter, and then it will eventually go into orbit around Ganymede. And I want to finish with just a little bit about 
what comes after and the missions that will eventually get us into the ocean of Europa. And here I want to emphasize a really exciting connection. Uh, with our rovers on Mars, before we ever send them to Mars, we test them out in the uh, Mojave Desert or the Atacama Desert or places on Earth that are Mars-like. Well, when it comes to exploring Europa's ocean or Enceladus's ocean or any of these other ocean worlds beyond Earth, when we think about the robotic capabilities that JPL and other centers will build in the decades to come, the test bed for those robotic vehicles is our own ocean and our own cryosphere. And so there's this beautiful win-win where I'm part of this and a number of folks up at JPL are working to make this happen, where with the long-term vision of someday getting into Europa's ocean, we can also significantly advance our capability to better understand and explore, and explore Earth's ocean and cryosphere. So down at the bottom here, this is actually uh, a autonomous underwater vehicle built by Woods Hole and JPL in collaboration, bringing together one of the premier oceanographic exploration institutions with uh, one of the world's premier solar system robotic exploration institutions. Now, a specific story, um, I lead a team that, um, uh, where we've come up with this idea for this robot called the Buoyant Rover for under ice exploration. We uh, got to bring it down to Antarctica a few years ago, and I'll share with you just a few slides from that. The idea behind the Buoyant Rover for under ice exploration is that part of what I'm interested in scientifically is the ice water interface. Life loves interfaces. Look at us. We are standing at the interface between the solid earth and the atmosphere. Uh, liquid water, solid interfaces. You know, gas, liquid, gas, solid, solid, liquid. All of those are places where there's a lot of energy exchange and life thrives at those exchange points. So I wanted a robotic vehicle that could study the ice water interface. Something like this, but instead of roving on the ground, we said, let's make it buoyant and have it float and rove on the underside of the ice. And that was the genesis of the buoyant rover for under ice exploration shown here. And there's actually a little tail in the back that you can't see, and that provides the torque. Uh, when we're down there at Casey Station, uh, partnering up with the Australians, you can see the penguins absolutely love this. Here, Dan is pushing the robotic vehicle under the ice. Um, yeah, they were super friendly and curious. You can see like little Jimmy over there. He's like, what's going on, guys? Um, there's actually one, uh, at one point, they jumped up out of that hole, freaking us all out, uh, and, and fell back on the ice. This is what our vehicle looks like on the underside. Uh, and what I want you to notice um, is another aspect of the rationale for this design. Uh, an ROV, a traditional ROV with thrusters, if you want to position yourself on the underside of the ice, the thrusters are going to mess up the interface, the exact thing that you're trying to study. But here you can see that we're not disturbing that interface much. We do leave a little bit of a tire tread, but we can study. This is the, the rover eye view. We can study these gas bubbles and these algal mats up close. And our goal, and I just actually received a, a $3 million grant to continue this work, uh, our goal is to leave it out under the ice for a full winter to see what happens to this photosynthetic community when we go into the Antarctic night and there's no more photolytic energy to drive this ecosystem. What takes over? Who survives? How does it survive? And there's just a, a close-up. There's a brewery coming out. Um, and then I'll just close with the dream of dream missions. Uh, I've, um, sadly, if you ask me what year to put on this mission, I would say 2100. Uh, though if any of you has a large checkbook, we could move that date up. Uh, but in this dream of dream missions, which would come after the Europa Clipper, after we land on the surface and characterize the ice, we would deploy a melt probe. This melt probe would have a heat source, 
likely nuclear, to get us through the ice. It would leave behind a fiber optic tether and some acoustic modems to get the data back up to the surface and back to Earth. After it gets to the ocean, the nose cone would pop off and that would come a, uh, an autonomous underwater vehicle. And then in my dream of dreams, we would navigate this using AI and all sorts of things to the seafloor and find hydrothermal vents. And we would discover not only microbes, but we would also make contact with intelligent jellyfish-like creatures that would change our understanding of life in the universe forever and ever. Okay. Yeah, that's so I'll, I'll leave you with this final thought, which is that um, of all the images I've shown, my favorite from the history of space exploration is this. It's an image drawn by the hand of Galileo, Jupiter at the center, and what we now know to be the four moons, the four large moons of Jupiter around it uh, 400 years ago. Um, Galileo initially called these the stars of Medici because the Medici family was funding his research. He was no idiot. So, uh, uh, but night after night, he noticed that they moved, which of course was heretical. It got him in trouble with the Inquisition. But through Galileo's careful mapping, he put the final nail in Aristotelian cosmology and opened the doorway to the Copernican Revolution. And in the decades after Galileo, we would come to understand with other telescopic observations that the laws of physics work beyond Earth. And then with the advent of spectroscopy, we would come to appreciate that the laws of chemistry work beyond Earth. And then in the decades and centuries that would follow and with the advent of the space age and our rovers and our spacecraft going to Mercury, the moon, etc., we would come to appreciate that the principles of geology work beyond Earth. And so of the four major sciences, we know that physics, chemistry, and geology work beyond Earth. But we have yet to make that leap for biology. We do not yet know if biology works beyond Earth. We have every reason to predict that it could and should, and maybe it's everywhere. Or maybe life on Earth is some sort of biological singularity. But part of what excites me about the time in which we live is that for the first time in the history of humanity, we can build the tools and technology to pursue this last great experiment to see if biology, the phenomenon of us, the stuff of life, works beyond Earth. And so I hope that some 400 years from now, our descendants will look back at some pictures of Europa or other worlds with the same awe that we look at a picture like this and say, it was then, it was during that time that they did the experiments and made the discoveries that brought the universe to life. Thank you very much. We can take a few questions for our speaker. Back to the tree of the light, and if you are looking for micro, uh, some, some, uh, some thing, which part you are looking for? If you want to wrap your stuff now. Uh, that's a really great question. So the question was, if we go back to the tree of life, do we? Do we have any inkling of, should we be looking for bacteria or archaea or eukaryotes, etc.? And this is a question that has motivated a lot, a lot of interest in what is the most primordial organism on Earth? And what does the tree of life on Earth tell us about um, the most ancient capabilities of life on Earth? And so while the tree of life from DNA, RNA, etc. is not necessarily a map to the first organism, it does reveal to us that certain attributes and certain metabolisms, such as producing and or consuming methane, may have been one of the first things that microbes learned how to do. 
And so when we think about worlds like Europa and Enceladus, to some extent, we might do well to search for organisms that we know here on Earth called methanogens or methanotrophs, uh, microbes that create methane and microbes that, that eat methane. And that's just one example. There's also microbes that metabolize sulfur. Um, but who knows, maybe it's something completely different, right? Did you get a call on who well, we got two right by you. Yeah, uh, uh, so are we talking about uh, multicellular life being possible on moons that have liquid water? Or are we just hoping for like some sort of self-replicating amino acid? Uh, great question. And this is um, the, the topic of chapter. Uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, this is one of my favorite questions. And in particular, it's a, it's a really good question when it comes to Europa. So I didn't go into detail about some of the other things that are produced via radiation on Europa. I talked about the salt. Well, another amazing thing that we see on the surface of Europa is condensed phase molecular oxygen, okay? The charged particle of radiation comes down, splits apart H2O, some of it goes to H and OH, some of the OH recombines with OH, you get H2O2, you know, some of that decays to O2. We see molecular oxygen in Europa's ice maybe some of that oxygen gets delivered to the ocean below, helping to oxygenate the ocean. And maybe, as it did here on Earth, an abundance of oxygen could then Darwinianly motivate multicellular life. Now, a tremendous amount of speculation in there, but I don't think it's unreasonable to you know, speculate that, uh, at least on Europa, the energetics might 